Hiya, Lucy. How Hello. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very well. Um, let, should we start off by talking about uh, your new record, Choices? I have to say, oh. it's incredibly open. What's prompted you to be quite so confessional on, on this record? I think I've always been a like an a very an, an oversharer both personally and in my music but I think this whole record I really I didn't realize I was writing a record when I started writing it so the album is called choices because I made a hell of a lot of choices in the last couple of years and every choice that I made just in a sort of like cathartic sense in the sense that instead of writing a diary I kind of just write songs I started writing these songs and then I like I normally release an album every couple of years and within a year after my last release I was like I think I've got an album and so it was kind of an accident that it was so confessional but it it was um it's just a narrative of everything that's gone on and I I can't write I can't hold things back <laughs> I just can't one of the things that, that struck me uh, when, when I was listening to the album um one of the songs is Flowers. Now, that's quite an atypical song for you, I think, because your songs are quite, they're often quite, you know, bright and poppy, and, and there's usually a, some, some, a bit of humour in some of the songs. But this seems to be a bit more of a, a sensual song, a little bit more, a bit more raunchy. Was that a deliberate sort of aim with that song? Kind of. Well, I've gone through a lot of changes, and one of which is an experience with changing the way I feel about my body and and obviously that's that's been quite a personal thing but I've documented that on social media and things like that so people know quite a bit how about how I feel about my body I walked into the studio and um I, I said oh, I, I want to write a song that shows that side of me that I I've never even witnessed before and often when I want to work out how I feel about something I'll, I'll write it down and so Flowers was like, yeah, I want, I want to, for me, I want to venture into that because it's really, this is the first time in my life at 29 years old that I've felt sexy. And, um, and so I, I put, it, put it on paper. And that's a weird thing for me to say out loud, <laughs> believe me. One of the, one of the things that, 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 that struck me, you, you mentioned that you've been documented on social media and weirdly enough, it's become sort of like a tabloid thing as well. The newspapers have picked up on it. I suspect because of the X Factor stuff. And it, it's quite, it's a good story. You lost a lot of weight. Uh, you, you've changed your body shape. Um, and then you got a load of abuse for it, for, for making that choice. And then you wrote a song called Animals. Just tell me about that as a response to being trolled quite badly I think and quite in a quite a nasty way well I just think I mean initially trolls troll schmolls I mean they're they're a very weird bunch of people and you don't really tend to come across them a lot in real life but during lockdown there's been this really blurred line between what's appropriate to say and what's not appropriate I think because we're lacking uh you know real human contact and so people have been people have been mean Pretty mean. And so they say it's horrible things about me and I've always been very sensitive. I've always been very open. So people have the ability to cut me quite deeply because they know my vulnerabilities, which is a choice that I've made. But for a long time, it made me very sad. And, and then I decided around, around about the time I wrote Animal that whatever people call me, instead of taking that on board and getting upset, I'm just going to become it. So you call me a bitch, I will be a bitch. If you if you call me a name, if you treat me mean, I will be mean. And and that's what animal is about. It's about metamorphosis. It's it's like turning into something that's more powerful um, for survival, really. One of the other really powerful songs on the album is about a topic that I think a lot of people are uncomfortable can be uncomfortable with, which is addiction. And uh, sober is 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 your sort of response to that. Just, just can you tell me a bit about where that's come from? Because I think that's to do with your own relationship with alcohol, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm 19 months sober, um, and when the week I decided to stop drinking, and I've been a, a drinker since I was like 12, 13. It's like a, it, it was one of the founding parts of my personality. I 
I wanted to kind of freeze time and I wanted a constant reminder of why I've made these decisions. And, and really I wanted to like work out why. So like I said before, I started to write them down and that's where the song came from. And to me, when I listened to it, you know, people say, what, what, what can, what keeps you staying sober? And to me, I listened to that and it, it quite blatantly lists the reasons why, you know, I, I want to be better and I, I want to, I want, I want to be liked. I don't want to keep making mistakes and, and being sober entitles me to be able to do that. You've worked hard to sort of develop a very strong fan base. Do you hope that fans will, you know, or, or the people who listen to your music will, will take something from that song? You know, no matter what sort of addiction it might be, that there, there is, you know, there is a there is a, a pathway out of, of, of being in quite a dark place, I think, where you were at the time. It's really interesting because the song's been out for a while now. And the other day I, I had a look on the YouTube comments and I don't know if you've seen the video, but the video is me to camera singing the song. And I just broke down in tears for the, the video. And underneath there, there's thousands of comments of people with their own stories of addiction. There's food addiction, alcohol addiction, narcotic. P people are using the comments as kind of like a forum to share and discuss their stories. And to me, that's like one of the most humbling things to see is that that song or the video could evoke any kind of emotion or thought about a relationship with something that is detrimental to you or your health in any capacity. So the fans have received it amazingly. And like people message me all the time saying they're trying to, they're trying to go sober. I spoke to a BBC uh, radio DJ a couple of days ago who spoke to me in June who said he now he and his wife only drink on the weekend because of a conversation with me and so to me that is like that's better than that's better than a lot of things because it's not about just being sober it's about you know changing the way that we deal with things and for me dealing with things was always drinking. How do you think your fans are going to react to this new album? I mean, I think it's a bit of a departure. I think it's a bolder album, both lyrically and, and I think you've, you've, you've tried to, to really, you know, push your sound. Do you think you'll get, I mean, do you think people will react to it in the way you hope they will? Well, I think the response so far has been really good and they've been some quite like curveball, like you say, there are some curveball sounds on it. But rather than a departure, I think more people have seen it as more of an evolution because the last five albums, they were very, they weren't immature, but this album is certainly more mature, both sonically and lyrically. It's just, it's got more, uh, it's got more beef. It, there's more to it than just some songs about love or songs about being young or having a dog. It, it, it's, it's, it's more, I think. And I, I, I think that they like that. Turn into, I suppose, what we might call it the X-shaped elephant in the room. Some people might say, you know, you, you appeared on the X Factor, which is a decade ago. And it seems yeah. like only yesterday. Um, that some people might say, well, that, that just shot your credibility um, by appearing on that program. What, what would you say to those people who would make that argument? I'd say that, I mean, I would have made that same argument years ago. Uh, I'd say also I would have been closed-minded to to have made made that observation because I was touring the circuit I played my first show when I was 12 I was I was playing uh I was playing five shows a week when I went on the X Factor I was in talk with two major label label rec record labels who wanted to sign me but only if I lost some weight for one and if I changed my name to Lucy Diamond and wore a top hat and some Doc Martens and a princess dress while I played for the other one and to me, that there was no chance I was going to sign a deal like that. So somebody said, well, why didn't you go on the X Factor? And of course, my first response was like, are you joking? I'm like, uh, you know, I supported Reckless Derek. <laughs> it's like I, I played the punk scene as well, because that was the kind of thing I just took any show. And, and I said, no, there's absolutely no way that I would do that unless I was able to play my own songs. And I was the first contestant in the show's history of 10 or 11 years of uh, reality tv of people singing covers to play their own songs so i do understand that 
the X factor is synonymous with a lack of credibility. Absolutely. And, and to make that assumption is, you know, what most people would do. However, if you're looking at it individually, what I did before that, what I did during that, which was change the history of uh, the show and what I've done after that would warrant more respect and more credibility um, than a lot of artists out there. So let's, let's take that next stage. You finished The X Factor. What did you do next? How did you build what is a quite a formidable fan base? I mean, you've had half a million views of Sober, for instance, on, on YouTube. This is you've got a loyal fan base, and you don't get that sort of thing by accident. How did you build it? How did what did you do well, to say right? Okay, I've done that. I've done the reality stuff. What next? Uh, there was a tour. There's an X Factor tour where they do arenas for however many months, and they asked me if I wanted to do that with them, and I said no because I or well, I didn't want to because I was done with that. So I started off in small venues, doing shows across the UK, which is what I knew. Um, so about the size of Borderline in London, so 100, 200 cap venues. I was promoted by Kilimanjaro um, and we started there. We just started touring. I, I released a record with Columbia um, and that was my first top 10 record. And, and I toured and I toured and I toured and I toured and I toured. And for the last decade, I, I haven't stopped. And traditionally, I do... Uh, one big UK tour, one small UK tour, two European tours, and at, at least two uh, American tours in one year. Um, and it's funny, like in the UK, it went from 100 cap, the next tour was 200, the next one was 400, the next one was 800. And so when I visit a city, I can tell you what the smallest venue is because I played it. And I can tell you the medium sized venue. And now like, you know, in Manchester, Last year we did three and a half thousand in Manchester Academy, Shepherd's Bush Empire. I played Coco. I played Borderline. To be honest with you, it was like starting all over again, but with all the plus sides of being catapulted in front of eleven million people every weekend. But the plus, the minus side of people saying, "Oh, I'm not going to listen to that record because because of a predetermined opinion," which is a rightful one as well. Looking back on it, you've you've done all of those tours, uh, you've done all of this work. What what what's been the highlights for you as a performer to think I never thought I'd do that in a million years? You know, going from well, a play, playing to four people in a back room to this. This is weird. What what are those things? Because I think all performers have those moments where they go, "This is just so weird and freaky." Well, I know exactly the one that you're talking about for me. Um, I was asked to play Glastonbury in 2017. And this would have been my third year at Glastonbury. So I played last year as well. And I was booked to play this year, but obviously pandemic swooped in. Obviously being asked to play Glastonbury is a huge part in anyone's career because there's a gate. You're not getting past it if, if Glastonbury don't want you. No one from X Factor or, or Britain's Got Talent or reality TV has ever been asked to play Glastonbury apart from me. So I, I always considered that to be off limits to me. Um, so when they asked, I felt sick. <laughs> and I felt sick when I got there. Um, and it was the most incredible show I've ever played in my life. I, I cried halfway through it. It was the acoustic stage, so it, multiple thousands of people in this tent and like that would be amazing at any festival but when you're stood on a stage at Glastonbury and these people have traveled to come and see you it it actually blew my mind like it that that to me will stay with me for the rest of my life um it gives me goosebumps thinking about it like one of the things that, that struck me I mean you came out I think when you were 14 um and you've got a very strong fan base in general but obviously a lot of lgbtq plus people follow you as, as someone who, from the community how important is that to you and do, do, do you think that the visibility of, of acts like yourself and others is is there for people who perhaps don't have such an easy path to being who they are not as easy to come out 
not living in a place where there's where there's an obvious community they can tap into. Is that is that something that you you, you feel is important to you as a performer? Yeah, um, I mean, absolutely. I feel one of the most important things that you can ever achieve as a human being is to live as your, your true self. And it's harder for others than it is, you know, like be, being gay, it, it's, it's not just being gay, it's not just being a lesbian. It's like, there's so many different variants of that. There's being gay and having parents that accept it. There's being gay and being thrown out of your house when you're a teenager and there's being beaten up for being gay and all kinds of things like that. And I think for me, there was never a question of whether I was going to be out or not. Um, because in turn, by hiding that about myself would be completely against everything I've ever said, which is be yourself. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's actually an honor to be part of a community that are so supportive. Um, there's a massive underrepresentation of, of lesbians in the music industry, especially younger, younger ones. Um, and I am really proud to be out um, and to be considered an influence to, to younger gay people. That's, that's an honor. Finally, um, it's a question I'm asking all, all uh, the acts at the moment. It's been a year since we've been able to get in a room together and have that unique communion between a performer and the audience. I mean, it's all well and good, the digital stuff, and that's that's been great for people to be able, to be able to make a living and keep connected, but there's nothing like the live experience. And I noticed you're doing one of the these album... Um, album launches uh, with a gig uh, at Crash, uh, with Crash Records in Leeds, at the wardrobe. What other plans have you got uh, post-pandemic to get back out on the road? I assume you're, you're chomping at the bit. I am definitely chomping at the bit because I've never known life without touring. Um, so to me, it was a real like removal of life, really. It was just bizarre. Uh, I am so keen to be back out playing. However, I am not going to be playing any shows or put on any, any tours until I know that the audience are going to be completely safe and that my actions aren't going to be part of another spike. Um, regardless of what we told, what we're told we're allowed to do, me and my team will be using our initiative and our desire to keep people safe for when we when we decide to put shows on uh, and I think that that is if we want this to get better we've all got to have that mindset really uh, it could be easy to say yeah you know that CP festivals have jumped on this 21st of June announcement and they're right we're selling our tickets and we're getting this on and it's um it's a bit irresponsible I hope the very very best thing I hope we're all vaccinated I hope we're able to play our shows but I, I think it's irresponsible right now and uh so in my heart as soon as I can bloody get out and as soon as I can be on that stage I will but in you know in my in my head I just want people to be safe I want us I want people to stop dying um because yeah because I'm a human and all like Thank you so much. Good luck with the album. Thank you uh, very much. And, and hopefully we'll see you back on the road before the end of the year. Uh, safety, obviously paramount, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I think not only your champion of the but I think we're all pretty desperate, including your fans. So good luck with the album and thanks for your time. Thank you very much.